Head on Fire is a Patreon-supported podcast. Supporters of the show get early access to ad-free episodes, a private Discord server, archives, and more. All benefits are offered on a sliding scale, so no matter your level of donation, you never miss out. If you like this show, consider supporting it with a dollar a month or whatever you can at patreon.com slash headonfirepod. Thanks, and enjoy the show. Confession time. I hate horror movies. Um, I Listen, it's that's not that's not fair to say that I hate horror movies. The correct way of saying that is horror is not my preferred genre. When I think of sitting down and getting cozy after it's been a long week or a long month or however that friend song goes, um, I I just I think of like a a comedy. I think of of science fiction or fantasy or some an epic adventure or or something cozy and sweet and funny and maybe slightly predictable or something like that like i i like to laugh i like to feel good and horror isn't that now i you know in my own writing when i'm telling a story i don't shy away from you know the stuff that makes up the horror genre i i I will happily dive into that but when i'm consuming stories I, I just, I want to smile. I want happy things to happen to happy people. But, 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 I was challenged several months ago uh, by Dr. Eva Burke. Uh, you may remember her. She was a guest early on in the life of Head on Fire. Uh, she is a professor of uh, pop culture and literature. She teaches crime novels and uh, all sorts of other really, really cool things having to do with pop culture. She teaches reality television and all kinds of things. Um, And she challenged me way back during that appearance to give horror a shot. So she made me a list of horror movies to watch so that I could kind of get an education, a reintroduction to horror. And so I watched those movies, almost all those movies, and... (laughs) We had a chat about the value and significance of horror movies, and that is today's interview. But before we dive into that, I did want to let you know about one of the sister shows here on the Audio Boom Network. Uh, did you know that 90% of the world's millionaires build their wealth through real estate investing? And in today's economy, rental real estate is the number one investment you can make. If you're interested in sharpening your financial education while building wealth, you've got to check out the Investing in Real Estate podcast with Clayton Morris. Clayton is a longtime buy and hold real estate investor. He covers all kinds of topics like the changing economy and housing market, the best investing strategies for beginners, retirement planning, and more. He also offers an interactive experience by answering listener questions in a weekly Q&A. Join Clayton and guest experts like Rich Dad Advisors Tom Wheelwright and Garrett Sutton to build wealth while building your financial intelligence. Whether you're new to real estate investing or an old pro, you'll be glad you tuned in. Take a second to subscribe to the Investing in Real Estate podcast now. All right, all that business is out of the way. Let's get to the interview. Dr. Eva Burke, welcome back to Head on Fire. It's so good to see you again. I'm so happy to be back. I am so, okay, I am personally glad to have you back. I am not, I'm not happy about the (laughs) circumstances under (laughs) which you are back. But during your last uh, appearance here on the show, we did, we did talk about the fact that you do teach horror and genre fiction. And Mm -hmm. I did express that I am a baby when it comes to horror Mm -hmm. and I don't like it. And so you, you promised me that you could possibly get me to come around or at least come back on the show and kind of Mm -hmm. discuss horrors. That's what we're here to do today. It is spooky season. Uh, It's October when we're talking. It's the perfect time to talk about horror. Um, So I just want to j- dive right in because um, at this point, I-, I normally would say, oh, you know, for folks who don't know who you are, but if they don't know who you are, they can just go back and listen to the other episode. Yeah, they, they, they can figure it out. They can figure it out. So you teach <laughs> horror films and genre fiction. And for anybody that mm-hmm. isn't watching the YouTube version of this, I'm putting air quotes around genre fix- fiction, mm-hmm. which is ostensibly teaching students how to critically engage with this format this genre Mm -hmm. this uh literary um canon i want i have a couple of questions for you one i have tried to figure out a definition for genre fiction Mm 
or genre mm-hmm. film or genre whatever. And I cannot find a unifying definition anywhere on the internet. Uh, some people say that, oh, it's 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 like a B movie. It's a bad movie or it's a this or that. Um, mm-hmm. And then there's other people that say, oh, it's anything that falls into horror, thriller, suspense, et cetera. But all of those have names. So how do you define genre fiction? I think it often is used pejoratively as um, an insult or kind of the implication is that it's not it's not literary or it's not um, arty or it's not kind of culturally good for us. Um, I tend to prefer the term popular fiction. Um, and this makes it a bit trickier because sometimes people will say, OK, you know, Pride and Prejudice has sold a lot of copies. It's very popular. Does that mean it's popular fiction? Mm-hmm. And I would say, no, I use the term popular fiction um, to refer to um, kind of mass market um, fiction or cultural output that is targeted at a very wide base of people, if that makes sense. Um, generally, it is marketed um, in ways that are very recognizable to you. So if you walk into a bookstore or if you go on Amazon, um, if a rom-com like comes up on your page or a, a crime novel comes up, there are kind of signifiers that will make you aware of what it is um, quite quickly. Um, and horror is one of the better ones for this because uh, the, the marketing material and the uh, the visual content and the what we call paratext, so everything kind of surrounding the text, like the blurbs, there might be a blurb by Stephen King, um, you know, it's very, it's recognizably um, a, a, a piece of that genre. It belongs to that genre um, in a way that something like maybe Sally Rooney's work um, maybe doesn't, if that makes sense. The marketing and the paratext is kind of less explicitly um, genre in that sense. Can I ask for a few more definitions? So mm-hmm. there are a few genres that kind of intermingle, overlap, yes. sometimes get confused for one another. Mm-hmm. Uh, horror, thriller, suspense. Mm-hmm. I'm sure there's a few others. Maybe you can help me fill in some blanks here. Yeah. Could you help um, me define what each of those are, how they're different from one another, mm-hmm. you know, what they are, suppo- like what each of those is supposed to mean? Yeah, I think there is a lot of kind of cross-pollination that confuses things like paranormal romance for example Mm. um is a recent semi-recent example um that kind of confuses definition and it is very hard to draw parameters or to draw boundaries and say this is definitely um a horror novel you know someone might say twilight is definitely a romance novel um but that doesn't exclude it from being also kind of gothic um and paranormal um i would say another one (laughs) well yeah (laughs) and the I think of the Gothic as kind of the grandfather of horror. Mm. Um, so I teach I teach earlier Gothic, like things like Frankenstein, uh, Carmilla, um, and then coming into the kind of 18th century, things like The Monk by Matthew Lewis. I think that would be explicitly almost a horror novel rather than a Gothic novel. Um, it's kind of a fine distinction, but um, the Gothic and horror, are, uh, I think, is, is an example of what you're talking about. Um I mean, the example, the other example I go to is like a detective novel versus a thriller. Um, I think you might have an idea of the distinction there. A detective novel or a procedural, for example, like a crime procedural, usually has a professional detective of some kind um, or a police figure or some kind of figure of authority um, who's carrying out an investigation from a position of authority. Um, whereas a thriller, especially the kind of domestic thriller, which I'm very interested in, um, they tend to be kind of civilian protagonists or people who are very much enmeshed in the crime, like they're being victimized themselves. You Does know, that mean that the late Angela Lansbury was in a thriller uh, in Murder, she wrote? Um, she belongs to a tradition of kind of amateur lady detectives, which is a very interesting tradition. Um I, I think we could make the case that she uh, that she was um, in a very mild kind of cozy thriller. Um, I a yeah, cozy I, I, thriller. I would, oh, I love that. Oh, I would yeah. like to read a cozy thriller. <laughs> yeah, there is a whole subgenre called like cozy crime. That's um, you know, there are murders, but um, they're quite 
sanitized and they're not very gory or violent and sexual violence doesn't usually exist um and a lot of people like that because it's there's murders but there's also a lot of doilies it's very yes very there's sweet. like cats solving murders and like librarian solving i'm murders. sorry did you say cat solving murders yeah yeah I this was, is both I... of them are. I yeah to read about a cat solving a murder i used to think it was ridiculous and then the pandemic happened and i was like i, I get this i completely understand the desire to have like a bit of excitement but it's contained in a little english village and you know nobody's really in so in I, I know i'm reading a thriller when there's typically somebody solving something and mm. a thriller is usually not a person of authority uh mm. governmental authority uh, it's yeah. not a detective it's not a person from the government it's it's a mm. civilian protagonist is that i'm reading a thriller then yeah that would be the distinction i make between like a detective or a procedural and a thriller mm -hmm. um so and there are i'm reading suspense oh gosh um I mean, that's such a broad question. Um, I mean, how do you define suspense? Like, do you mean the effect? Like, do you feel suspense when you're reading it? Is that what you mean? Oh, I don't. It's a category. There's thriller, yeah. suspense, horror, and they all. Mm. Uh, but I, I, I have struggled to figure out exactly yeah. what each of those words mean. Because usually when it's somebody says, oh, it's a suspense. It's a suspense mm -hmm. movie. It's a suspense novel. It's a suspense, or a suspense thriller. I have heard suspense I've thriller. I've heard of that too. Yeah. And I don't, I don't know what makes something suspense mm -hmm. versus a thriller versus explicitly I think horror. A lot of them are marketing terms that um, are kind of arbitrarily applied. Gotcha. Um, but I, I think it is very hard to draw kind of distinctions. Um, for me, something that is suspenseful or like a suspense novel, um, often there are, it involves kind of the uncovering of secrets, um, intimate secrets, family secrets, maybe. Um, maybe it's less explicitly violent um, than, let's say, a crime thriller. Um, yeah, it, it's, it is quite hard to it's quite hard to define i do think there has been a, a move inward in the past kind of 20 years um with the thriller so we're really in people's homes now and i'm sure you're aware there are so many kind of domestic thrillers yeah and do not it, like nope I, I will tell you we haven't we haven't started talking about movies yet but i will tell you a movie that i started because sometimes you know when a lot of people are talking about a movie when it's everywhere when it's you know and i and i don't think mm -hmm. it's going to be explicitly a slasher or even if it is a slasher i don't know sometimes mm -hmm. i'm like okay i can see some blood and guts today um mm -hmm. so i saw the strangers which is oh, allegedly yeah. based on a true story and I, mm -hmm. I, I i mean i had to work myself up to it um and mm -hmm. i i had to stop that movie about mm -hmm. 30 minutes in and for anybody that's ever seen that movie they will know the point at which I stopped because yes. it's the first time that you see that the guy is in the house and, yeah. and Liv Tyler doesn't know that he's in the house. And I was like, mm -hmm. nope, that's <laughs> noped right on out of that one. I think I'm, I'm not a fan of that film um, nope. for several reasons, but I think it the first half of it is kind of masterful in how it builds suspense. And I have used that scene as an example for students in a in building suspense um but i'm not a fan of the film because um for me that's the worst example of a slasher in that the characters are so so stupid and they make such poor decisions that i my sympathy just wanes because um i can't well, buy into that's, that's me with almost every slasher we i i promise i promise the audience we will get there we we have a whole list of movies mm -hmm. that we want to get through and stuff but that mm -hmm. that yeah any i my problem with slashers tends to be everyone is very stupid. Um, yes. So, um, but I do want to go back to the idea of critical analysis. So mm -hmm. instead of just trying to define these, you also teach how to critically engage with these types mm -hmm. of stories. Um, what does critical analysis of this type of genre fiction look like and how does it different uh, how does it differ from critically engaging with something that's maybe more universally found in a literature course or in our film studies yeah. or something like a Shakespeare or your mm -hmm. unit on poetry or Chaucer or something like that like how mm -hmm. 
how does critical analysis of this genre differ from something that you might find in a normal classroom? Um, I think we begin with a kind of an understanding as a class and as a group that often this is fiction that is devalued for a number of reasons, like culturally devalued. Um, it's not part of the canon. Like it's it's not Shakespeare. It's not Jane Austen. Um, it's not Seamus Heaney. Um, and I think we might ask start by asking ourselves like what goes into the canon? Why is this not part of the canon? What's different between this and canonical fiction? Um, are there reasons like are there gender reasons? Um, like I find when I teach romance fiction and chiclet, um, students are still far less likely to take that seriously as um, academic material in contrast to something like fantasy or sci-fi, um, which these days I find, um, you know, if you're reading something like The Lord of the Rings or, um, you know, Invasion of the Body Snatchers, um, they seem much more inclined to, to sort of accept that as like worthy of academic focus or attention. Um, but other, I think, more explicitly gendered uh, forms um, still seem to to kind of attract a lot of, of questions about quality and content. Um, and that's something I think that's a big part of what I do and a big part of popular literature studies in general. Um, questioning what it is, like what underlying assumptions do we have about things like value? Um, you know, what makes a good book? What makes something worth reading? Um, you know, is plot more important than the use of language? Um, can we look at something like Gone Girl or Bridget Jones's Diary? Can we find literary merit in there? Um, because I think we all come to this with this particular subject with a lot of preconceptions and a lot of baggage. Um, because, I mean, right up until you get to college, um, when you're in school, you are taught like Shakespeare is what's worth studying. Um, you know, Elizabeth Barrett Browning is worth studying. Um, we don't study the Hobbit generally. We don't study Gone Girl. We don't study um, a, a lot of crime fiction um, at that level. So I think we come to it with a lot of um, preconceptions and breaking down those preconceptions um, is part of it. Um, looking for value and, and even just interrogating what we think value is, what it means. Um, and also I, I really like to think about whether escapism is a bad thing because I find a lot of the criticism of popular fiction and, and popular culture more, more kind of broadly is oh, it's very escapist and uh, people just want to watch this and sort of, um, you know, forget the real world. And I think there's a huge value in escapism. And I it makes me very sad that we, we don't really think that there is um, or that people feel like they should be shamed or, um, that they shouldn't talk about reading something for escapist reasons. Like it's 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 enough to read something because you enjoy it. Um, you don't necessarily need to feel shame and and um, like guilt or hide what you're reading because you think other people won't approve of it. Um, I remember when tw the Twilight like phenomenon was happening, and I remember jumping on the hate train for Twilight because I was like a teenager, an older teenager at the time, and I was like, yeah, this is a really bad book. Um, and I'm not saying that Twilight is is necessarily like well written or a good book, but so much of that looking back now was just about um, shaming people for for enjoying something that we didn't think deserved to be enjoyed. If that makes sense. I, I it's interesting that you bring that example up because I find it interesting mm -hmm. how people reacted when those books were popular to the idea that Stephanie Meyer was a good writer. I distinctly remember a Stephen King quote where, well, okay, I distinctly remember Stephen King commenting on this. I'm not exactly sure of the exact quote, but mm -hmm. it was something like they compared Meyer with Rowling mm -hmm. and he was doing so very disparagingly. He, he basically yeah. said Stephanie Meyer couldn't write her way out of a paper bag and J.K. Rowling, oh my gosh, she builds these worlds and this and that and the other and all of the critical um sort of obsession uh with mm -hmm. rolling and how meyer was just raked over the coals as this terrible unoriginal yeah. uninspired writer who lucked into the right book at the right time and lucking into yeah. the right book at the right time is a whole different discussion but mm -hmm. 
I bring that up to say I find it interesting now the revised critique mm -hmm. of Rowling's work now yes. and how we are looking back at it and are mm -hmm. willing to pick it apart yes because it's now because now you know because she's now fallen out have, of favor yeah you have free reign because yes i mean i think and oh the racism was there all along the homophobia was there yeah. all along the transphobia was there all along and i bring all of this up to say it's so interesting how we all felt we had permission to do that with meyer in the beginning mm -hmm. and we we waited until Rowling exposed herself as a turf and transphobe and all of that. Yes. And and then we went back and picked it apart. And I think yeah. there's a conversation there about how we judge certain genres and certain works mm -hmm. based mm -hmm. on the preconception of you're either writing for an audience that consumes silly things. So mm -hmm. Meyer wrote for young women. Niche girls, and yeah culture culture hates anything that's for young women it just or, does yeah um whereas Rowling was writing about this young magical boy who was super super special and we love to tell young boys you can all super, relate super special. yeah yeah um I think you've picked you've picked out a few things here that are really important which is firstly I think the author as personality mm -hmm. um and the idea that we that what we think of the author has anything to do with what we think of the work, um, which is a very big question. Um, obviously, I don't I don't agree with with J.K. Rowling's uh, views on anything anymore. Um, <laughs> I had been a huge fan as a child, obviously, as sure. many of us. Who were. was I was eleven when that first book came out. I was yeah, 11, same. I was, was eleven. Same I mean, yeah, it was. We formative. aged. Up. Yeah, we yeah. aged up at the same time. Yeah, um, it was I'm, formative. I'm not a fan of. <laughs> because it happened with Joss Whedon as well and Buffy I'm not a fan of when somebody is exposed as a terrible person I'm not a fan of going back and saying oh well, I always hated their work or it was always bad I find that so toxic and so yes. performative and yes. unnecessary bad people can make good art and it's childish to pretend otherwise you know um yeah this whole we hated them the whole time revised yeah it's not, no we didn't no we it's didn't. okay to admit that you you liked it um yes. I'm not saying Harry Potter is is fine art or that it's very well written or anything, but it's okay to say I I really enjoyed it as a child, and you know some people still find comfort in reading it, yes. um, reading old books or whatever. Um, but also I think Stephanie Meyer was kind of she was never really going to succeed with cer a certain group of people because she was openly a Mormon housewife who talked about how the book the idea for the book came to her in a in a very romantic dream. Mm -hmm. um and that was kind of catnip for people who who already weren't willing to take someone like her seriously um and I think there's a huge aspect of that that's incredibly gendered and if the same thing happened years later with uh, E.L. James who wrote uh, Fifty Shades of Grey which obviously was based on on Twilight mm -hmm. um and again I'm not saying that the content of the books is necessarily good or that the books are good or whatever but it was really kind of derisory like she's a housewife you know what would she know about writing or um kind of implicit critiques of like older women's sexuality that th these women were like sitting at home lonely and kind of fantasizing and like you turning their fantasies into mass market fiction um and i find that really really troubling um because it's a critique of who's writing it. It's a critique of who's reading it. Um, you know, the understanding that, okay, this is for like desperate housewives or like women in like sexless marriages who just want to get off and read like um, Fifty Shades of Grey. I find that really, really problematic. It just says a lot, I think, about who um, who we think consumes romance fiction in particular um, and how we still contain a lot of those. Or we still put forward a lot of those really regressive ideas about um, who's reading it like the romance genre is um, in 2022 there are so many like queer stories there are so many different um, versions of kind of love stories um, and stories of sexuality that it, ma it makes me really sad that people are still very kind of regressive or um, have this kind of stereotype in mind but I do think that's what that's what Stephanie Meyer fell afoul of um, being a conservative religious woman um, I'm not saying I agree with her religion or her or conservative beliefs or whatever but um, 
but she was never things gave us permission to yes. find fault with her much earlier yeah from the outset almost um but i do think it's funny that in the intervening years stephanie Meyer has just gone away and kept her money and just been happy and now jk rowling is this just or did she or did she there's all of that oh she's, she's, still she's writing, writing her pseudonym these days i've heard that yeah yes. um, I just, yeah, I'm fascinated by her. Um, I don't think, I think that there was, I will I will still argue, I think there was the kernel of a good story in Twilight. Um, and some of her other fiction is not terrible. So, yeah. It, it, I don't think that it would have sold the number of copies that it did. Having the right book at the right time, mm-hmm. having the luck of the algorithm, all of those kinds of things, mm-hmm. SEO, search engine optimization, all of those things can, can help. But... Mm-hmm if there's nothing in the story it's not yeah i mean you know i agree i, I, I read 50 that... shades there was at least something enjoyable i mean it it, it was at least yeah. an entertainment factor to them yeah it was it was mildly compelling i mean i read the first two books i didn't sure. finish the series um but yeah i kept reading it i, I wouldn't have finished if there wasn't sure. like something in there um so, so yeah let's talk about the way that critics engage let's i want to i want to bring it back to horror um mm-hmm. critics famously hate horror mm-hmm. hate genre stories generally speaking and they are almost always excluded from major awards yeah it, it is it's up for debate whether or not an exception was made in 2019 when parasite swept mm-hmm. all of the awards i'm not sure if that's horror or thriller or suspense or a genre mm-hmm. or if that was something else something so new and so unique that it was able to defy genre um but but suffice to say why do you think that critics people who are paid to critically engage with material have such a universal distaste for horror genre stories generally speaking and do you think that that influences mass consumption i think that horror is very much perceived as trashy like a guilty pleasure which is a term that i hate um something that you can watch and laugh at or enjoy but it's not to be taken seriously um I'm not sure. I wonder if it comes from like the kind of B movies of the 1930s, like Frankenstein um, and the Dracula movies and the idea that this kind of spectacle wasn't really to be taken seriously. Um, I also think horror makes a lot of people uncomfortable in a way that we don't really like to acknowledge. Um, Even if you are, if you're not a fan of horror, um, you, you may have this kind of kind of really deep rooted um feeling that it it really unsettles a part of you that you don't like thinking about um and I wonder if that's one of the reasons like one of the deeper reasons why culturally we don't value horror as much as I think we should um but also I think horror and the gothic more generally I think its function is to um there's a brilliant quote from a, a lecturer called Jared Colleen. He says that it kind of transmogrifies our, our real life anxieties and it, it gives them back to us to, to kind of think about in ways that are not um, explicit. So, you know, something like hereditary, which I know you hate, um, we might look at as something about loss and grief um, that it sort of, it allows us to explore um cultural or personal anxieties in ways that for, for whatever reason we're kind of afraid to confront directly um that might be one of the reasons um it's also it's just it's painted with the genre brush and often that will mean that it's put in the b movie bucket and that it's not seen as art um there's a huge in the past kind of five six years there's been, there's been this huge thing of like elevated horror um, people like Ari Aster and Jordan Peele Age who make uh, yeah. yeah yeah who make um horror movies for for the kind of people you're talking about and I really hate the idea that this is a thing I think horror is horror and um if you think it needs to be elevated then you're not really a fan of horror um I I, I don't think that the genre needs to be elevated in any sense I think that it's always been um as as good as as the stuff Jordan Peele is putting out and it's just that we are for whatever reason we need it to be dressed up in the um kind of respectability of A24 and um and things like that to, to, to kind of be seen to take it seriously which which really bothers me um in terms of Parasite I think Parasite is kind of a genre bending 
one. It goes from like a kind of comedic film to a sort of domestic thriller. Uh, and then there are aspects of horror and then it's a family drama. And um, I think that was kind of an anomaly, though. I don't see I don't see a horror movie um, breaking into kind of like award circuits. Um, if it didn't happen for The Witch and if it didn't happen for Hereditary, which, again, I know you didn't like. And I know it was very divisive, but I still think Toni Collette deserved more recognition. Um, for her performance in that film, I think Tony Collette deserves more recognition, generally speaking. General, in general, I just, yeah. I just wish it would be for a different movie than that. But <laughs> I do, uh, but I recognize as an actor and as a performance, mm-hmm. she had to go to some places oh. that were certainly other people have won, have taken home little golden statues for less than she gave yep. in that movie. I will, I will, I will concede that. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, but I think if she didn't win, if if those films didn't win, I don't know. I like the lighthouse hasn't hasn't really. Midsummer. Um, Midsummer. Yeah, Midsummer. I, I don't. I don't know. I don't see it happening. No, I didn't. I didn't. I mean, I I watched it and I was like, oh, mm-hmm. that's interesting. It could have been forty five minutes shorter. But you know, that's <laughs> yeah. that's me. That's pacing issues. Um, I I want to talk because you've you've mentioned the word gendered several times and it made me think of a conversation mm-hmm. that I had with Joshua Conkle, a uh, screenwriter mm-hmm. behind um, Chilling Adventures of Sabrina, and he's got some uh, movies. I think he's sitting in the director's chair next, so that's pretty cool. Mm-hmm. Um, and he's done a lot of of TV work, but specifically deals in the spaces of horror and uh, uh, that kind of thing. And and I think has a, a podcast now where he goes back through and sort of does a, a critical rewatch of uh, various horror movies. Anyways, it made me think of conversations with him where he talked about the fact that horror has always been a place for underserved minorities to sort of express mm-hmm. anxiety fear to examine fear to put the fear on the on the screen as 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 not the the thing in the background but as the story itself not as subtext mm-hmm. but as text and to examine it and to work through it and to sometimes be the hero yeah um why do you think women minorities queer folks uh engage with horror specifically and it was interesting how this dovetails into so you gave me a list of films yes to watch mm-hmm. and i was remembering that conversation with uh joshua while i was watching the first one which was black christmas yes and i thought this story couldn't mm-hmm. have been told in another genre the yeah. the main Maybe. story what's her name jess the the jess. main yeah. the main character her mm-hmm. story is an abortion story. Her story mm-hmm. is a story about a woman wanting to retain autonomy over her life to not mm-hmm. be told by her college boyfriend that they have to get married get and married. she has to have mm-hmm. a child. I mean, I mean, it was practically a feminist manifesto. I mean, it was a, yeah. a brilliant story and it could not have been told in another genre. No, I agree. Um, I think one of the reasons that horror resonates with um marginalized groups of people is because it gives us permission and space and almost maybe that kind of critical neglect that you've talked about um gives us kind of further permission um in thinking that maybe people aren't really paying attention culturally so it's okay we get away with with exploring things like abortion um exploring things like kind of bodily autonomy um there is a critic from the 1970s called Ellen Mears who um, coined the, th- the term female gothic. And she talked about how the gothic uh, traditionally and, and horror as well, I think, has been a space for um, women to explore fears of like entrapment, uh, bodily entrapment, um, like literal entrapment in some cases, um, fears of bodily destruction as well. It's one the of the reasons. The mother comes to mind with. Yes. Uh... Uh, Darren Aronofsky, uh, Jessica, Jessica, Jennifer Lawrence. Jennifer Lawrence. Yes. Um, and that's one I think that straddles the line we've talked about between being horror and being like acceptable, acceptable cinema. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I think though Black Christmas is a fantastic example. And one of the reasons it's one of my favorite movies, um, it's my favorite Christmas movie. I, I just think it's, I think it's phenomenal. Um, is that it's just it's so festive. I watched uh, it with my husband. My husband loves Christmas. My husband loves mm-hmm. horror movies. Loves mm-hmm. horror movies. Loves to be scared. Loves them. Mm-hmm. 
Um, and it, uh, he, he is very excited to have a new movie to add to the, his watch list. Oh, the Christmas movie list. Yes. Mm, yeah. No, it's, I know that the director made a film called A Christmas Story, which is not really a thing here in Ireland. It's not that well known, but apparently in America- the same director? What? Yeah, apparently he made this film called A Christmas Story, which is a big thing in America. This um, film, wait, 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 yeah. wait. I'm sorry. I need to, I'm. No. Yeah. No. I know that it's a big Christmas film in the States. It's not a thing here, but yeah. I, it's, it's because nice. it's so specifically American. Yeah. And the only reason why it would be anything is because we were like force fed this movie. Like it was mm -hmm. on like cable reruns. It started off. It's so, that's crazy because that None. at least two of yeah. his movies then because Black Christmas was critically destroyed when it came yeah. out. It was time, a yeah. giant flop, and it's gone on to be mm -hmm. re-examined as I was reading up on it. The first slasher movie it inspired yeah. Halloween. It's it is now, yeah, it's now a masterpiece. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, and it's so interesting how he did that twice in his life. No. Accidentally made a masterpiece no. that was hate was not appreciated in its time. But I think it just goes to show how we that's crazy. That's crazy. the way that we devalue popular art and popular fiction can can kind of change over time and like maybe we'll look back you know i wonder what we'll look back at in 30 years and think oh that was actually a gem maybe don't worry darling or whatever um probably not don't worry darling. well i think do you think maybe that films even films that are much more niche or films that mm -hmm. require a specific point of view or a specific sense of humor or even specific references that they're that they are able to be appreciated if not immediately at least much more quickly after their release because mm -hmm. of streaming because of accessibility because people that might be yeah. in that audience can find that movie and celebrate yeah. that movie sooner. i think yeah i think it's it's more likely now because there's so much more accessibility mm -hmm. um compared to the 1970s um when maybe the audience just didn't the audience just wasn't there for this um but i love that it's um, remembered as a, as a, as the masterpiece that it is. Um, I think it's um, almost exactly what Ellen Mears talked about when she talked about female gothic, and um, it's a house full of women whose fears aren't being taken seriously by the authorities. Mm -hmm. um, they're having these like sexual threats thrown at them. Um, there's this abortion subplot that I just think is is really wonderful and ahead of its time, and just yeah. Um, well, but Barb, Barb was. Barb liked yeah. to drink. Barb liked yeah. men. Barb, you know, I mean, all of these people were just, all of these women were just, I, yeah. I, I get to be myself and there are no men in the house to tell me I can't. And the disapproving father is like played for laughs. Like yeah. he's the stick in the mud. I love that he's not validated in his uh -huh. nonsense. Um, I love the house mother that she's just this cat lady who is just perpetually drunk. Yeah. Um, no, I it's so ahead of its time. Um, Very I, ahead of its time. Yeah. When I first saw, I saw it. I first saw it about ten years ago, and I wasn't. I just didn't know what to expect because I think I'd seen one of the remakes. The remakes are quite bad. Yeah. Um, can I tell you why I think so? Yes. Because they gave the murderer a backstory in all of the yeah. other remakes. They gave him a reason. Mm hmm. I, I think. So. No, go ahead. I, I I think from from the if if this is the mother of slashers, mm -hmm. it, it, as as some articles that I read about this when I was doing the mm -hmm. research for this, this is sort of you know retroactively uh, revisionist the the mother of slashers the 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 mm -hmm. film that inspired Halloween et cetera et cetera. So if that's true, then the the slashers you know going back in my mind and thinking of any films that i have liked from that genre mm -hmm. the 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 slasher themselves the killer themselves did not have a backstory we did not need to know much yeah. more about him if they had a name great um there's a a gay there's a queer horror movie called hell bent that this movie reminds me of mm -hmm. so much and the great thing about that is that the killer has is just a just evil just evil mm -hmm. lurking in the shadows ready to kill you why mm -hmm. don't know does not matter all you need to know is that everybody in the movie is about to die and honestly i 
it it gave the rest of the i mean i i i wasn't sitting there trying to figure out motivation or trying to get into mm -hmm. the psyche of the killer and i think that there are some movies that can do that very well but i think for what a slasher is which is you know there's a terror in the night and you might yeah. be next that's all it needs to be I yes think. yes um, I think we've become obsessed with backstories, though, in the more recent um, horror films. Like, I know uh, Rob Zombie, he remade some of the Halloween films. And famously, he he gives Michael Myers, like, a childhood, ba a sad childhood backstory. Like, his mom is a stripper. Uh, and there are huge red flags there about kind of, like, oh, slut yeah. shaming and, you know. Uh, but she doesn't take him trick-or-treating, and he has a kind of a traumatic childhood. And we're kind of supposed to infer from that that this is why he became who he is but i hate that i much prefer the idea that he's just this presence he's just mm -hmm. this kind of manifest evil that has doesn't like a shark it doesn't have a um it doesn't have a motivation it doesn't have a a, a traumatic backstory it just wants to kill you um and that i think that's all a slasher movie really needs we don't need um maybe if you're making a movie about like, the zodiac killer or like a genuine crime then we can go into things like motivation Sure. I, we I watched Blackbird earlier this year. Oh yes, uh, with Taron Egerton and and the and the guy from Cobra Kai as the killer. Oh, but that, oh that was a sort of a phenomenal <laughs> psychological mm -hmm. thriller. I mean, you're you're mm -hmm. unfolding the layers of this killer. Yeah, and, and that was incredible. But the point of the movie is psychology of this killer. But in the mm -hmm. slasher, the the point of the movie is is the terror that hides in the night. Not... Yes, they're an object of terror. They're an agent yes. of chaos. You don't need to think of them as a per, a, a human with a history or mm. whatever. And I, I love that in Black Christmas, we know he has a name, probably. His name is probably Billy. Um, he has some kind of, I assume, mental illness or or some kind of uh, severe psychological problems. And he kills women. And that's really all we need to know um and he's he's lurking in the house and i i don't like that the the later films um kind of revise i think they did it with leatherface as well in some of the later texas chainsaw movies um which is i think a tragedy because we don't need to we don't need to sympathize or understand or think of him as a a nuanced human being that just complicates um the well, horror also mm -hmm. like you you brought up earlier it can very quickly become wildly problematic mm -hmm. uh disability advocates mental health advocates constantly yeah. point to the horror genre to say if you have mental illness if you have a dis disability specifically if that disability is physical um yeah. specifically yeah. if the disability uh is deformative in some way yeah. um immediately we are evil we are the other we mm -hmm. are uh we're the villain we're killing people yeah. because of our mental illness, because of our sad, tragic backstory, because of our environments, because of our bodies. Mm -hmm. And it's it's horrifying, uh, <laughs> since we're using that word, um, it's horrifying mm -hmm. to think of the ways that we, you know, talking about giving ourselves permission to do things and thinking that it's okay because, you know, whatever, um, the ways that we give ourselves permission to equate mental illness and disability etc cetera, etc cetera, with the potential for savage murder <laughs> mm -hmm. no i agree i think it's in it is incredibly problematic to construct a backstory for a character um a backstory that's kind of founded on like mental illness or family trauma especially if it's a character like leatherface or michael myers who we know is not fundamentally redeemable like we've had six movies of them chopping people up so <laughs> where are we gonna like there's nowhere our sympathy or understanding can really go. Um, and the message seems to be that like those traumas or terrible things or physical disabilities just create monsters or they make you a bad person. Um, and yeah, facial facial disfigurement um, is a huge one I've noticed in, in certain horror movies. Um, physical difference in general, mm -hmm. um, people who are physically other um, unfortunately tend to be um, positioned as kind of dangerous or um, if not dangerous, then sort of like pathetic or mm -hmm. um, I'm thinking of Texas Chainsaw Massacre and Franklin, who is Sally's brother, who uh, uses a wheelchair. Um, he's this really angry character in the film um, and he can't really participate in the things that the other characters are doing because he's a wheelchair user um, and his 
his frustration is very obvious. Um, but I would actually I would love to have a, a broader conversation with anyone who's listening about this. Um, about disability in horror and how well i'm uh, um, uh hitchcock was very famous for leaning mm-hmm. into men- mental illness as um, mm-hmm. as an excuse for violence for yeah treatment. um psycho namely <laughs> no. but it does i suppose it does unfortunately like validate this broader idea that mental illness is dangerous and shameful and it shouldn't be talked about and if you do have a mental illness then you're a danger to people around you Mm -hmm. um i like that black christmas doesn't really specify um what what exactly is wrong with this person um or, or what's really going on if he's just evil um and i do think it can be um kind of stigmatizing to have a a character who's um sad backstory we see or we hear okay he has mother issues or his mother abused him or whatever um because then we either have to accept that it's not really his fault that he did this or we have to accept that um people who go through these experiences might be violent and neither of those things are correct you know i i kind of want to ask just very directly uh, i i gave my thoughts on it earlier but i want to ask you you know, the expert, what do you find is the cultural value, the cultural and social value in horror? Mm-hmm. Um, I think that horror, for many reasons, allows us to think about things, things like death um, and danger and violence and um, specifically gendered violence in ways that we don't really get to do with other um, genres. Um, something like Black Christmas, as you've mentioned, it gives us space to think about um, even a topic like, you know, these girls have been getting kind of harassing, obscene phone calls for we don't know how long, but for a while, enough that they, they're they familiar with, with it happening. Um, and there has obviously been no kind of intervention or police intervention um, to this point. Um, and something like that, I think, as you said earlier, um, I'm not sure if that could have been explored in a different film or if there would have been space to explore that in a different film. So I think that one of the cultural values that horror um, kind of gives us or one of the things that it allows us to to do is um, is really look in the um, in the kind of warped reflection of these things um, like gendered violence, um, like violence against certain minorities, um, as ridiculous as horror often is. Um, you know, I, I think it is often seen as very unrealistic and outlandish. Um, but I think that it's one of the best genres for really allowing us to engage with certain um, like social issues. And um, as you said, in allowing us to think about kind of minority experiences in ways that maybe we wouldn't have before. Um, because generally, if you're watching a horror movie, especially if it's a slasher movie, you're being asked to relate to and to empathize with somebody who is being victimized, somebody who is being pursued um and attacked and you're putting yourself maybe in a position that you haven't been in before so let's say you are like a heterosexual white man uh middle class and not, you're not... i can't even begin to try <laughs> really hard um but i mean not to generalize but you know vulnerability or certain kinds of vulnerability might not be something that you are used to experiencing mm-hmm. um there's a fantastic book by uh carol clover called men women and chainsaws and she talks about how she um, she really wanted to get to the question or get to the answer of why slasher movies were popular, um, why slasher movies where women were victimized were popular. And she found that to some extent, teenage boys and men, um, they were rooting for the girls. They wanted to to see her live and succeed and 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 fight back. Um, so I think that horror can do that for us. It can give us the experience of vulnerability. Um, a kind of safe vulnerability that maybe we haven't experienced before that we're not experiencing with other genres um, if that makes sense um, I would highly recommend Carol Clover's book it's it's really really fantastic um, just really fantastic like deconstruction of the genre and um, slasher movies and gender in general I, I recommend it to everyone I think it's wonderful the horror film uh, mm-hmm. has sort of had an evolution over the last mm-hmm. 50 years or so. Mm-hmm. Um, you gave me a list to sort of give me a kind of a redux on on the evolution of the horror film. Um, and I've, I've made valiant efforts to get through it. Uh, mm-hmm. And I will I have it all. Yeah, uh, it's a list. 
Uh, it is a very good list. Um, mm-hmm. I will will uh, the the films on the list because uh, I I posted it on social media and people got mm-hmm. people who are very into horror were very <laughs> impressed with this list. Oh uh, really? <laughs> oh yeah. Did you not see all the little quote tweets? I'm like, oh my god, this is the best list. Yes, this this should be. If you want an intro to horror list? This should be your list. So yeah, there a lot of lot of love for this list. Mm-hmm. Um, so the list for anybody listening, if you are looking for like seven nights of horror mm-hmm. leading up to Halloween, uh, it starts with Black Christmas from 1974. Uh, then the original Texas Chainsaw Massacre, which I had seen because I'm from Texas and I feel mm-hmm. like it, you're just not allowed to get out of Texas unless you've seen that movie. Somebody's like, oh, did you know? And then they will tell you, oh, did you know it's based on a true story? And then you go look up that true story and you realize. Oh. yeah mm-hmm. stuff that's based on a true story is always it's usually cobbled together from different yeah. bits and pieces or yeah oh. yeah like the exorcist is based on a true story but it's yeah. based on the same true story that like a million other yeah. sort of supernatural yeah. horror movies are based on uh anyways mm-hmm. uh the third movie on the list was the fly from 1986 mm-hmm. which i was excited to see i you don't you know, mm-hmm. science, sci-fi horror is an interesting kind of uh, space. Uh, Alien famously kind of lives in that space. Mm-hmm. It's a horror movie in space. Um, Candyman from 1992. Audition from 1999. The, I will tell you the horror aficionados were uh, were very impressed by the addition of that movie. It is. On the list. It's a wonderful film. Um, I will say for anyone who is of a sensitive disposition, there is a scene towards the end that's famously harrowing. Um but it's a it's a wonderful wonderful film. It's it's very very good. That's all I'm uh, gonna say. The next movie is Lake Mungo from 2008, mm-hmm. and then finally Suspiria from 2018. Mm-hmm. Uh, so up here at the top, Black Christmas. Mm-hmm. I was very pleasantly surprised by how much I liked the movie. Like genuinely liked the movie. And one of the things mm-hmm. that I really like about some of these earlier uh, horror films is, is that they are 90 minutes. Mm-hmm. Yes, it is a I tight think- movie. A horror movie doesn't really need to go beyond 90 minutes. I, I yeah. don't think. I mean, I'll make exceptions for like Midsummer, but um, I know you It's two and a half hours long, my dear. Let me just. No, I, I, yeah, I tried to bang that one out this morning and I was like, oh my gosh, this is very long. <laughs> yeah, it's an immersive experience. Um, I agree. I don't think horror necessarily needs to be. I think it's more effective when it's tighter and shorter. Yeah. Um, with few exceptions, but yeah, I I do like that it's a it's an hour and a half, and, and that's all you need really. I appreciated that. Um, mm-hmm. Black Christmas. I I I really enjoyed it. Um, we've talked about it a lot. I just want to say that I feel like um, if this were made today, with the mm-hmm. same reverence for the original like if you were basically just to remake it scene for scene the mm-hmm. only tweak that i would make is that jess and barb end up together jess and barb oh, clearly had yeah. chemistry yeah yeah i would yeah i would love that i would also like to see peter suffer more um i just i hate peter so much <laughs> so peter is so interesting because it's it's interesting that you bring that up because i feel like the the character of peter is where you really start seeing Mm -hmm. this idea that horror movies are a way for us to, I don't know if it's live out the fantasy of the Mm -hmm. horror or something, but but to process the horror, I guess is what I'll Mm -hmm. say, to process our horror on screen because Peter is, Peter is like one bad day or five bad years away from being a horror in and of himself. Yeah. You could uh, so easily picture him being the abusive person. and all sorts yeah. of horrible things. He hasn't done it yet. Yeah. Um, he does die in the end. And uh, and I feel like Jess, <laughs> if she lives, uh, mm-hmm. if she lives past the end credits, which it's kept we vague whether yeah. or not she does, um, if she lives past the end credits, I feel like she's going to have to do some processing of the fact that she killed probably an innocent man. Um, yes. I think, though, I like that it's a film that's almost like steeped in cultural misogyny and mm-hmm. there is the killer who's doing these things but there's also so many kind of what we might call like microaggressions or moments of yes. like small acts of small violence like him say she tells him she's pregnant and he was like okay we're gonna get married and and she was like she's like no I, I have a life I have mm-hmm. dreams I don't want to do this Um, and he increasingly kind of pressures her to do that and that's such a obviously he's not trying to kill her but he's trying to sort of make He's trying to stake a claim on her body in a, in a way that's more, I think, insidiously violent. 
um, and the police as well when they go to report Claire missing um, he says so the policeman at the at the front desk says oh he, she's probably just shacked up with a boy or whatever and mm-hmm. um, and they, they refuse to kind of take it seriously at that point um, which again is of agency of validity in the way that yeah. uh, women aren't listened to unless a man speaks for them yes because the boyfriend intervenes I think he's mm-hmm. friends with the detective and he mm-hmm. comes to the police station and it's at that point that it's taken seriously and mm-hmm. um yeah and also um i think just the the father as well claire's father coming to the police station um just his presence seems to validate it as something that's worthy of being like investigated um the way that they treat the the female characters um i think is very interesting so it's almost i think we might say it's like an escalating series of acts of violence against these women um there are obviously the murders in the house but so many kind of smaller things that um, that color their experiences in the world and um, that make this easier, make it easier for him to do this, make it more um, likely that this will happen. I think that line, the call, you know, the famous line, the calls are coming from inside the house. I did which not is, realize they, that that's where that came from. Yeah, my boyfriend, well, my fiance, fiance now, um, didn't realize that either. He was joking throughout that they were going to say that line. And I was like, yeah, no, that's where that comes from. That's where it came um, from. But let's like, honestly, let's look at that as like a metaphorical statement on you know the violence is inside the house it's mm-hmm. not just um it's not just this guy it's it's all around them they're they're swimming in it you know um that's yeah that's one of the reasons i love this film so much i will tell you that the red eye at the end mm-hmm. unsettled me scary yes it, it, it was, it was mm-hmm. I, I didn't i was not I, I appreciated that even though it is the mother of slashers, um, mm-hmm. it's not a violent film in that yeah. the there is not a bunch of gratuitous corn syrup being thrown mm-hmm. everywhere. Very much unlike our next movie on the list, which was Texas Chainsaw Massacre, which is sort of the birth of that buckets of blood kind of thing. Yes, I think for some reason, I think people... When people forget about the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, if they haven't seen it in a while, they expect the body count to be higher. The body count in that movie is quite low. Mm-hmm. Um, I What I love about the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, um, which came out the same year um, as Black Christmas, is that it's it's got this apocalyptic vibe. Um, you feel like, maybe this is a Texas thing, I don't know, uh, but you just feel like this could be the last place on earth. Um, there's such a sense of hopelessness. Yeah, that's Texas. Yeah, but... <laughs> It's just so, um, I, I can't even explain how it unsettles me um, on a really profound I can't way. either, Dr. Eva Burke. I can't explain <laughs> how Texas unsettles me either, but it's I could so try. Apocaly- it's so apocalyptic. Um, yeah, I, I, I'm I, a huge fan of this film. Um, it's very different to Black Christmas. Um, I'm a huge fan of it for that reason, because it has this sense of doom. Um, it's just kind of imbued with doom. Um, and there are all these references at the beginning to kind of fate and like um, star signs and horoscopes, um, which I find really, really interesting. Um, it's also, it's almost like a Scooby-Doo episode gone wrong, which I really like. It's a van full of teenagers trespassing where they don't belong and then terrible things happen to them. Um, but no, I I think it's phenomenal. Um, I also just visually, I think there are so many images and stills you could take from that movie that are like art in themselves. Like it's just, um, it's a a really low budget, really terrifying film. The rest of the 70s and 80s really show you that kind of young teenage, Mm -hmm. lots of body, lots of blood, lots of everything. You've got your, you've got your Freddy Kruegers, you've got your, uh, you got your Halloweens, you got your... Um, you know, lots of girls in skimpy bikinis out by a lake somewhere and there's a killer and sometimes they're given a backstory and sometimes they aren't. The, mm-hmm. A lot of those don't appear on the list. So just that era of horror slasher, whatever, what do you think the conversation is there? What's what's happening with those movies as horror evolves? Yeah, I think I think I'm not so the reason I chose these two movies from the 1970s is because I think that they're almost exceptions to the rule. Um, mm-hmm. I didn't choose Halloween just because I, I assume you've already seen it. I'm a big fan of Halloween um, as well. But I think 
in the 1970s, what we see in a lot of these films are anxieties about female bodies, um, female autonomy, the kind of changing role of women. Um, I'm sure you're familiar with this trope of the final girl. Yeah. Um, it comes from a which, lot of these Which films. then became a movie called Final Girls. Yeah. <laughs> um, but the idea is that often that she is, um, her friends might be more sexually active or they might be doing things that are, um, the parents might disapprove of, but the final girl is generally quite pure. Um, the final girl she, is pure. She typically has a gender neutral name. She yes. typically, there's there's all of these tropes. And yeah. I hate that I know so much about it because Joss Whedon talked about it so extensively because he wanted Buffy to be mm -hmm. sort of the final girl flipped on its head. That's yeah. Sort of but I mean, final girl as badass karate chopping hero sort of mm -hmm. began. I think, I mean, obviously as well, as we said earlier, um, it's okay, I think, to look at someone like Joss Whedon's work and to talk about his work and things that he's written. Um, well, and he was a very, influ I mean, it influenced a generation yeah. of. Himself. And try to separate what we think of him Yes. from it as much as he's we a can. bad person <laughs> yeah That's, he's a bad um, person objectively just, a terrible person yes but, objectively a bad um, person his work yeah. has influenced many genres yes and we can't there's no point denying that it would be foolish to deny that um yeah so the final girl kind of emerges in this period and as he said she's usually pure um and she goes through a lot but she tends to survive until the end um so that's a huge trope it's not one that i I might just be jaded because I watch a lot of horror movies. It's not one that I prefer or enjoy to wa enjoy watching now. Um, a fantastic film actually from, I think it's from the mid 2010s called You're Next. I think it's 2013, 2014. Um, really d does a great job of deconstructing the final girl. Um, so the main character is at her boyfriend's um, family's house for the weekend and uh, they're attacked by mysterious slashers. Uh, but it turns out she was raised by a survivalist father um, and she's got insane skills um, and she <laughs> starts killing the killers. Um, and it's just, it's really, really good. It just really deconstructs that idea of the final girl as um, just a woman doing her best to survive. Like this girl is a badass. She's not, she's hunting them by the end. You know, it's brilliant. Um, so yeah, no, in the seventies, you see a lot of this um, anxiety about women and uh, women in homes and younger women, especially like experimenting with drugs and experimenting with sexuality. Um, and I think that's partly where the final girl comes from. Uh, the next movie on the list is The Fly. Mm -hmm. You hated it. I, um, I went to look at the reviews for this mm -hmm. movie like the you know the rotten tomatoes and all of that mm -hmm. fully expecting it like many horror movies to have like a somewhere between like a 40 to 60 yeah. percent critic score and then like a 90 percent audience score that mm -hmm. typically is like oh that's probably a good horror movie when it's like yeah. critics hated it audiences love it it's probably great kind of thing mm -hmm. um it is universally beloved by yeah. critics and audiences yeah. So clearly there's something wrong with me because <laughs> I just saw no redeeming value in this movie whatsoever from any standpoint at right. all. I hated this movie. Um, could you tell me <laughs> as a doctor what's wrong with me that I hated this movie so much? That's a longer I, conversation. I thought it was bore. I thought I just, I thought none of the decisions make any kind of sense. Gina Davis is, I, why would, why? Ha, Gina Davis, honey, like there's no, yeah. she had no character. There was no, that woman had no personality except to like heave at, at uh, <laughs> um, uh, Jeff Goldblum. Like she was just, she was there to mm. let you know that Jeff Goldblum was a sex god or something. Like that was her entire function in the movie. She has no personality. And I could not believe for the life of me that all of the reviews are just like, oh my God, the characters in this movie. Oh, this is just such strong character development. I'm like, who must? <laughs> Where? How? Gina Davis has no character. She is boobs and lips. That is her entire character in this movie. Okay, okay. I think <laughs> I some of that. the critical acclaim that you're talking about here might be linked to the fact that David Cronenberg is kind of considered 
um, an auteur of horror. So he's considered, um, yeah, but he, he's considered uh, somebody who's very important in the genre, somebody whose work is very important. And I think there might be a broader conversation here about um, certain filmmakers and their output um, being critically beloved, even if certain people don't like it. Um, I am a fan of it because I'm a fan of body horror. Um, I really like to see, I, I'm interested in seeing uh, the kind of physical um, degradation of the character, the way that he physically changes. Um, I also think the effects are really good, um, which For is something that... I don't yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah, I don't usually notice that, but I think the effects are really good. Um, I think, also, I, I, I was thinking about it, I noticed that this and Black Christmas both have abortion subplots. Uh, where the female character wants to uh, abort a pregnancy or end a pregnancy, and the other, uh, the male character doesn't. They're de- they're dealt with very differently. Yes. Mm-hmm. Um, the scene where Gina Davis gives birth to the maggot thing, I think, is just fantastically horrifying. <laughs> I laughed. Is that supposed to be scary? Well, okay. Let's let's just pause for a second here. I think that sometimes horror can make you laugh, and that's okay. I think that someone like Jordan Peele, for example, uh, one of the reasons he understands horror and good horror is because he comes from a comedic background. Mm-hmm. Um, and almost, um, there's almost value, I think, in the absurdity of some horror. Yeah, um, like, sure, I know a lot sure. of people find Ari Aster's work um, like funny to watch because it's just so outrageous. And yeah. you're like, what am I What am I seeing? What is this? Um, I think that can be good. I think that horror sure. um, can be funny. And just because it makes you laugh doesn't mean it's not scary. It doesn't mean that it's not um a horror movie yeah, I, just, um, I just i i, I respect I, I respect your opinion on, on the fly though. i just didn't i nothing nothing about anyone's decisions in this mm-hmm. movie made any sense whatsoever and i i mostly G, mostly gina davis i just thought if mm-hmm. a, i i i think i got i was live tweeting it and i think i got about 90 seconds into this movie and i was like oh a man wrote this not just a man a <laughs> white man a cisgender heterosexual white man wrote this movie and i was like oh three heterosexual cisgender white men wrote this movie i was like there was not a woman involved in this movie in i mean that you know that with a lot of 80s horror though a lot yes. of 80s horror, yeah it's very i um, would i think I think the movie could be done well i would lo- i would i would mm-hmm. engage with the body horror of it i would love to see a woman because this is not this is not Cronenberg's story. This is based mm-hmm. on a short story. Yeah. Um. And I read the short story. I went back and read the short story because I was like, surely the source material has to be better. And then it was. The source material is much better. Mm. It, it it's much better. Um. It's so much more interesting. And there's there's a horrible choice made at the end that I just yeah. didn't feel was conveyed on the screen. But um. Uh. I would love a woman to write the fly. I think. There is an argument to be made that we can go back to. I I enjoy the fly. I think the fly is a good film. So we disagree on that. But I think that just because it is, we might say it's okay. I'm gonna I'm gonna use an example here. Um, mm-hmm. a slightly different example of uh, films from the 1970s, a genre, a subgenre called rape revenge movies. And these are films like I Spit on Your Grave, The Last yes. House on the Left. Mm-hmm. Um, famously very exploitative, but has been some feminist revisionist mm-hmm. um, or revisionist criticism of these films. Like they've been redeemed almost, or they've been looked back on with some uh, with a feminist lens, and they find value in that. And I think that that could be something that you might do with The Fly, um, or with some of those films that are very um, kind of male gaze centric. Mm-hmm. Uh, that you might find. I'm not saying that you have to, or that there are things that you might find more enjoyable on a second watch. Um, but I think even a film that is, um, we might say it, it's definitely not a feminist film. I think I still think we can go back and find value. Okay, maybe um, I'll go watch. Past. Maybe I'll go watch. I spit on your grave, and then I'll go back and rewatch. Oh God! And see if it. <laughs> I mean, I I mean I find that that subgenre very um, distasteful. I don't enjoy the exploitation of it. Um, but I still think that there is value in the story of a woman who has been. Um, um assaulted in some way in her kind of finding it's it's very cathartic i suppose to watch her kill the man who did that to her um there's one that's lesser known it's called miss 45 um i think i'm getting the title correct but she is she is sexually assaulted and then begins to kill men with a gun 
and kill sexually violent men and it's just it's just so fun because they so deserve it and it's very I think compelling. it was so interesting how little so there's there there's a period of time in the 90s and early 2000s where horror wasn't there there wasn't a lot of love for horror and also even people that mm-hmm. like horror don't really have a lot of favorites from that time period yeah. um and i i i did there there were a few notable exceptions and mm-hmm. i think they they tended to all be based on the fact that like japanese horror was yeah becoming very 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 big uh, mm-hmm. and influencing worldwide uh horror filmmaking the ring the grudge a lot of other movies that starts with the um mm-hmm. Blair Witch Project was also a notable uh yeah. film it's kind of an anomaly it, yeah it was a weird anomaly of course then mm-hmm. from the Blair Witch found footage that became yes, a whole I mean, genre of uh of found footage horror things go back though to Cannibal Holocaust um which I think was the 70s or the 80s um uh, was one of the first found footage movies oh really um, I, yes, I, a very yeah, I don't horrifying. know a lot about the entire genre. <laughs> yeah, it's a very horrifying movie. Um, and um, it's a good film. I will say that the animal death... Oh, you, you mean is... the movie called Cannibal Holocaust <laughs> is horrifying? It's, it's uh, yeah, it's more horrifying than advertised. Um, the animal deaths on screen are are, are real. Um, no, which, no, Yeah, which is no, very upsetting. Um, but no, you can get never, a version no, of the no. film with, you can get a version of the film with those parts taken out, um, if you prefer. Uh, but that will be the first or one of the first found footage movies. Um, but yeah, no, when you were talking about that kind of late 90s waning, I was thinking of Japanese and um, Korean horror as, because mm-hmm. um, there are so many good examples from that time period, like The Ring, The Grudge, Audition, um, One Miss Call. Um, there are so many great, um, great films. Um, I think we tend to be, when we talk about horror, I suppose we as Westerners tend to think of Western horror first. Um, or, you know, we think of like maybe horror from Singapore or Korea or Japan as um, kind of as an afterthought or as something that we, um, it, it just doesn't occur to us to sort of culturally engage with it. But um, I have never failed to be scared and entertained by um, by a Korean or Japanese or Singaporean horror movie. Um, they're... They, they tend to be masterpieces in my experience. Um, all, huge of, all of the ones that I've seen have mm-hmm. the correct mix of dread, of understanding that mm-hmm. the shadow, that thinking there's a thing in the shadows mm-hmm. tends to be more terrifying than whatever the hell the thing in the shadows is. We don't need to see too much. It's, we don't it's, need to see too yeah, much. Yeah, I think Stephen King sometimes falls afoul of that line. Um, he shows us a lot sometimes. Um yeah the entire what is it children of the corn yeah it's all dreadful and terrifying and then Mm -hmm. oh it's a it's a monster yeah we don't need to see i don't need to see the monster the the clown is actually a spider alien thing yeah and it yeah it's not i think i i prefer the the sort of gradual build-up of dread and then the suggestion of horror and i think that's one of the reasons uh black christmas works so well is that we don't really ever get to see him full on uh, we see his yes. eye and we hear his voice and we see very brief glimpses of him running around. Um, and also the phone calls in that film are genuinely, I think, genuinely terrifying. <laughs> like yes. really, really I don't terrifying. know what I would do if I was getting those kinds of phone calls. I would, I honestly, that was one of the first things I said when I watched this movie for the first time. I wouldn't stay in the house. I would be gone. I oh. just the thought of someone like that. When the yeah. cop tells Jess, I want you to hang up. And I want you to leave the house. The house. No questions. Yeah. Just leave the house. And he, she doesn't do it. And then he's like, listen, the killer is in the house. You need to walk out. The front door is right there. I know. I would be gone. I would have been so gone. <laughs> that I, Jonah, no, absolutely. Of course, then I can hear people, you know, screaming at I mean, their, at, in their minivan at the speakers and, and being like, yeah, well, you're a white guy. Of course you'd be gone. And be like, yeah. But I'm like, gone. I love my friends, but I, I don't want to die. <laughs> no, I'll, I'll, you know what? I'll go outside, I'll go around to their window and I'll throw yeah, some rocks at the window, window and be like, hey, are you dead? Yeah. And, and if they yeah. don't answer, I'll be like, I guess they're dead. Yeah. So. yeah. I think, yeah, I say I think we would survive a slasher movie because um, our survival. Oh, I would, I, I would not go in the basement. Absolutely no. not. I would not no, go in the basement. I'm not going to go in the dark, creepy woods where the kill. Oh, you know, they say a killer hangs out in the woods on a full moon. Okay. Well, you know what? It's a full moon. Look- and there's those woods. Not going in That's there. For him. Yeah, I'm not going in there. No. Have fun. Have there's fun, a reason- Choppy McGee. 
really terrible film from a few years ago called Slenderman that's based on the Slenderman myth and um it's 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 absolutely dreadful but the worst part is there's a scene where they go into the woods and they wear blindfolds because you can't look at them um and if you look at if you see him he'll he'll haunt you or something uh-huh. and they they're there with blindfolds and within two seconds one of the girls pulls off the blindfold and starts looking around and I was I was in the cinema and I was like I can't I have to leave this is yeah. the stupidest shit I've ever fucking seen yeah Ooh. anytime anytime I'm watching one of these movies and people are immediately stupid I'm just why? nope yeah it's why I don't like the strangers I don't feel sorry for them I'm sorry but you're stupid get out get out of that house get out get out of yeah. that house get out. yeah. Um, how do you think the conversation around horror, what do you think the conversation around horror is right now? And, and I mean the conversation, what conversation do you think the horror genre is having with its audience right now? You, you mentioned Jordan Peele. While we didn't put, mm-hmm. while you didn't put any of Jordan Peele's movies on the list, I'm assuming it's because one, everybody knows about them right now. He's, he's sort of the master of horror these mm-hmm. days. Uh, Get Out, Us. I haven't seen Nope yet, no. not for lack of trying. It wasn't playing in my area. And by the time it was, I I was very busy that weekend and now it's not. So I'm just waiting mm-hmm. on it to come streaming. I can't wait to watch oh, it. Good. Um, uh, but what conversation is horror having right now? Um, I think that Jordan Peele is a good example uh, to bring up. I think he is allowing us to engage with like social issues, um, you know, issues of like violence against black bodies. Um, in his horror, um, no, I don't want to spoil Nope or say too much about Nope, but I think there's a broader conversation in that film about the nature of spectacle and how we are constantly filming and recording, um, and wanting to be seen by other people, um, that needs to be had. I, I think he's very insightful, um, and I, I also love that he is kind of married to the genre, and I'm sure has had offers to sort of move away from horror at this point, but is still very committed to it and is obviously a fan of it. Um, apart from Jordan Peele, like someone like Ari Aster, um, I think has important things to say about, um, about trauma and kind of inherited trauma, um, the effect that, um, that violence and loss can have on us. Um, Mike Flanagan is another one who's very productive. Um, he's got the Midnight Club now. He did Midnight Mass last year, uh, The Haunting of Hill House, The Haunting of Blind Manor, um, yeah, he's horror a little bit. Seeing a, the mini series is really where yeah. horror is kind of being consumed it's right flourishing. now. Another one yeah. just came out on Netflix. Uh, the, yeah. the the Watcher. The Watcher, yes. Yeah. Um, and that that genuinely is based on a true story, a really scary, really scary true story. Um, yeah, it's it's flourishing on streaming services. Um, and there does seem to be a a kind of preoccupation in things like The Watcher and in Hill House and Bly Manor, again, with kind of domestic horror, um, stories of like entrapment, um, feelings of being watched, um, which I think probably resonates with a lot of us these days. Um, That seems to be a preoccupation. There is a larger conversation happening with like respectability and horror, um, whether horror is something that deserves to be acknowledged or should be acknowledged, as something with cultural value obviously i think that it does um i'm not sure that it will happen because there is the stigma and sort of um sense that horror is kind of your embarrassing cousin that you you might enjoy spending time with them and they might be entertaining but you wouldn't bring them to like a dinner party or you wouldn't really necessarily talk about knowing them um it's so interesting but- how the people that seem to really love horror, women, mm-hmm. queer folks, people of color, you yeah. know, the, the folks who are, or at least, I don't know, maybe my social media feed is just very strange, but it seems like those are the people that just seem really diehard supportive of horror. Yeah. Um, are also sort of really diehard supporters of things like romance, specifically like mm-hmm. very raunchy romance uh, yeah. and how like with the advent of e-readers and audiobooks and stuff, how you don't have to be seen reading the mm-hmm. book that really shot the genre up into the stratosphere of consumption. Yeah. But it's so interesting how it, it, you're, you're making these things click for me of how these things really are seen as guilty pleasures by the mm-hmm. people who consume them. They're the things that it's okay for me to consume in the privacy mm-hmm. of my home. And that way you don't have to think I'm a weirdo for consuming this yes. nasty, trashy, raunchy, sexy, bloody thing. So exactly. It's, you know that people will 
th not think less of you, but that they might think differently of you or that they might think, well, maybe you should be reading like Ulysses or, you know, Jonathan Franzen yeah. or whatever. Um, <laughs> I, I hate you. <laughs> um, um, yeah, no, I think there is a link between um, the kind of guilt you're talking about. It kind of crosses genres, uh, especially horror. Horror especially, I think, appeals to people who are outsiders in any sense. Um, because it's... Uh, Generally, it's it allows us to explore vulnerability in, in very specific ways. Um, and also, I think horror, even if we, we think about kind of the, the bad guys of horror, um, like the, the Cenobites and Hellraiser, I think, are kind of famously interesting for people who are... Um, okay, so I've are, seen like, Hellraiser. Mm -hmm. I don't think I understood that movie. I think I'm very. I think I think I'm not smart enough to understand that movie. I've seen it once. I've seen it one entire time. If I'm remembering mm -hmm. correctly, the the pinhead people they they don't even really show up until like the last couple. Of yeah, minutes. no, it's been, it's been a while since I've seen the original Hellraiser. Um, yeah, I don't I don't think so. The, the puzzle box is there, and yeah, the, and the house is doing lots of weird. Things. Yeah, and the 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 human bad guys that are doing bad things. Yeah. Um, yeah. I was so um, confused. I was like, I thought there was this whole like otherworldly demonic sex thing No, I think that's the later, on. it's like, the later films. Oh, okay. Cause yeah. I, I saw the first one and I was like, I don't think I understood this and I don't understand why Pinhead is so iconic. And then that was just it for me. It was, yeah. it was like uh, uh, the, 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 Pazuzu in isn't that the exorcist is that oh yes yeah, the demon in, in the exorcist yes yeah and I was like I don't understand why we're talking about Pazuzu so much because it doesn't really mean anything in the I have not seen of any movie. of the I've not seen any of the sequels to the exorcist but that's the thing um, is I think it's elaborated on yeah it might just be that's the whole pro I I think the worst thing to do in in any horror is is expound on the horror it's yeah we don't need expansion it's yeah. enough to just have this one single it's horror like the Babadook that. Yeah, it was a contained story. We don't need more. Yes. Yeah, you know, I don't need more. Uh, it just cheapens it and thins it and makes it less scary when we know yeah. more. The more we know, it's it's the rule with anything. I think the more you know about something, the less scary it becomes. Um, like I heard about Charles Manson when I was like fourteen or fifteen, and it scared me so much that I decided to do a school project on Charles Manson, and by the end of it, I wasn't scared anymore. Okay, I'm very glad that you brought that up. That very mm. specific argument of empathizing mm. with real world killers, because mm. we are also right now having a very strange conversation around Jeffrey Dahmer because yeah. Evan Peters is so sexy. Um, and yeah. yeah, what do you think, why do you think horror works as a way to explore fear? But yet when we, when we, it's interesting how we keep talking about don't give the killer a backstory, but yet when we mm -hmm. do things like Dahmer, like like what's happening mm -hmm. with the Evan Peters, uh, yeah. Evan Petersification of Jeffrey Dahmer and the sexualization of Jeffrey Dahmer and how people are like, mm, I'd let Jeffrey Dahmer kill me. Yeah, <laughs> it's so upsetting. It's so upsetting. So what is what is what's happening there that's so different, and what is that? What, what how how do you critically engage with the, those? two different things like what what's the difference there why do you think one works and one doesn't and is there something problematic about the latter um yeah so i think with true crime narratives um there could be a couple of reasons i think one is that we know what really happened and um often it's in living memory and there are living like survivors or family members and uh it helps us to humanize the killer in a way because it makes it less it just makes it, you might think, okay, well, you know, this happened to him and that's why he is the way he is. Or, um, you know, Ted Bundy rescued a girl from drowning. So maybe he wasn't all bad. Um, it just makes it less, um, it just makes it I think, less existentially terrifying to think of these people as human. Uh, but there's also a huge bias towards kind of white male serial killers and people like Jeffrey Dahmer and Ted Bundy who are considered attractive. Especially um, when you have people like what Zac Efron and yeah, Peter exactly. And they are attractive. They are his name is and, objectively yeah. attractive people. Like yeah. so, it's it's problematic to have them play um, these characters. Often as well, they're kind of sympathetic portrayals, or at least um, very much centered on the killer rather than on the victims. Um, I know that the Dahmer TV show was heavily criticized by the some of the family members of the victims. 
I haven't watched it, and I probably I probably won't watch it. Oh, I, I won't. Um, <laughs> yeah, I don't. But also, I've seen I think, enough from TikTok of of the yeah. Evan Peters sexy workout scene, which it's seems upset. to him, yeah. But I mean, it's so we we can't ignore the fact that this is about a story about a white man killing black people and how um so many of the TikTok and eating them <laughs> and, and literally consuming them. But like so many of the TikTok reviews are white women who say, "Oh, you know, it wasn't that bad." Or uh, I wasn't. Listen, I want to call out my own people and white gays are are just so thirsty for Evan Peters' mostly naked body, and I'm just like, folks, just, that this is a real person who did real and terrible things. In very recent like, memory, like there are family members yes. who are alive. Like I don't understand. The, and I think the, it's so interesting how there's two different kinds of conversations that can be had there because when you're talking about a Leatherface, a Michael Myers, or something mm-hmm. like that, the 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 only time it ten it it leans into the problematic is when you try to give a reason for mm-hmm. it, and it feels like the the filmmaker always tries to say, well this reason is a universal reason. Well, of course, if you grew up in a home where your mom was a stripper, you would kill people. Of course, if you grew up with mental illness, you would kill people. Of course, mm-hmm. if you grew up with a deformity, you would kill people. You know, Jeffrey Dahmer, uh, you know, all, all of these other, uh, BTK, uh, even, even um, you know, the fascination with folks like the Zodiac Killer. You know, you mm-hmm. find the reason, you know, the Zodiac Killer, that that uh, that very famous, was it movie, miniseries, something like that a few years ago that tried to say it was mental illness and he was yeah. this kind of genius i think he, there, there was uh weren't they trying to hint that he was autistic or something like yeah. that yeah that's a that's a huge thing with the zodiac killer the, the yeah. conversation around him um i think so there's a really good book by a man called david schmidt uh, who works at the university of buffalo about serial killers as um, kind of america's celebrities or american mm-hmm. celebrities uh, but there is this huge um, this thing that happens with male, especially male white serial killers, um, that they become, we project so much onto them and we feel this need to understand them um, because they scare us, but also people are, people are almost attracted to, to this idea of kind of godlike figures who exercise control and execute people at will. Um, and it's a very different conversation to the conversations that you'll find around female serial killers or female killers in general. Um, we, for some reason, violent male agency um, is often celebrated in ways that violent female agency um, is not. So you never really see, or you very rarely see, um, I think Aileen Wuornos is one of the only ones I can think of, um, a depiction, a cinematic depiction of a female serial killer. Um, and there's a very there's a very big difference in the way that they are portrayed and the tone um i think mindhunter did a good job in the first season mm-hmm. of depicting these people the second season veered a little close to um a, a kind of not a celebration but um a kind of framing these people as celebrities that i was a bit mm-hmm. uncomfortable with um but generally i think that was a good quite a good portrayal of um of these people but to be honest, I would like to see true crime move more towards the victim. I know it's natural for oh, us to feel sure. it's natural for us to feel intrigued or interested by people who do terrible things because they're an anomaly. Like they're doing things that are unthinkable, and that's that's interesting. But I would like to see the genre move more towards like a focus on the people who are like left behind or people who have survived or people who didn't survive. And um, you know, we we talk about their lives and we celebrate their lives. Um, and acknowledge that they had potential and that they were people and that just because this person chose to do a terrible thing to them that doesn't define who they are who they were who they could have been you know um so i i would like that to be the direction that it goes in um there is a fantastic tiktok creator i cannot remember her name now but her mom was um the victim of a crime that is currently um the subject of a tv show it's called the thing about pam um mm, with Renee yeah, uh, yeah. mm-hmm. yes and this girl uh I think very eloquently talks about the experience of this happening and now her trauma being exploited for a TV show. That's kind of like a dark comedy almost. Mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. How uncomfortable she is with that story being retold in such a way. Um, and I think it's really interesting. That it really made me think about my own relationship with true crime and um, the responsibility we have maybe to, um, to think about these things from the perspective of the person who victimized, um, you know, to do that thing that we do with slasher movies, to think of yourself in that position. It's um, so interesting how, when you compare these two, the fictional horror 
the story mm-hmm. is typically about the victims. It's from the victim's yeah. perspective. It's it's women and and uh, racial minorities, mm-hmm. queer folks, you know, as the victims, but also as the protagonists, as the heroes mm-hmm. sometimes. Um, and when it's done well, uh, mm-hmm. the the evil is is the embodiment of evil. Um, mm-hmm. And when you start asking why is when you get into problematic territory, but when you get into true crime, the fascination is on, well, something must have happened to them to make them yes. do this. And we it's, are so... it's, the camera is now not on the victim. The camera is now on the, on the perpetrator. The exactly. Yeah. And but we can't, we can't make enough. Humanization. You would almost be like, oh, I guess if all those things happened to me, I'd probably want to kill somebody too. And it's like, which because you've probably also had terrible things happen in life and we're not yeah. also killers so it's so but as well we really flatten out the nuance when we talk about these things and like it's it's hard to find the nuance in um a story like jeffrey Dahmer's or ted bundy's mm-hmm. um but we as well i think just we are culturally prepped always to make excuses for certain types of people um like ted bundy was um you know a successful white man um semi-attractive some people might say um so we're pr- we're primed to say you know he didn't really mean it or maybe this happened maybe this happened to make apologies for him it's like you know? see yeah he did it by accident a few times um but you know we're i think we're just culturally primed to make excuses for bad men in some ways unfortunately um i think we make excuses for bad women in other ways so I, i'm kind of interested in the idea that female killers especially female killers who kill in a pair like uh, Myra Hindley or Rose West or uh, Carla Homolka, that we we like to think of them as victims or we'll say, okay, she was pushed to do this. It was really, he was the brains of the whole operation. Um, and I think that's wrong as well because violent female agency is something that we should acknowledge. Um, women can be bad too, essentially, you know? Country music is mm-hmm. rife with stories of mm-hmm. violent women, uh, but mostly they're revenge fantasies and you tend to root yes. for them. Uh, the Dixie Chicks did a great one. Uh, Goodbye Earl uh, is a good one. Um, Even Taylor Swift tells one. Yeah, I was just about to say, Taylor Swift yeah. just did one with Haim and uh, mm-hmm. I, there's a ton of them. Um, I think Reba McIntyre did one maybe, mm-hmm. uh, but they're they're always great. They're always great. Um, I feel like I, at some point I get to return the favor and I get to give you my version of Halloween movies. Yes, my I would love that. My, my Halloween is typically very mm-hmm. fluffy and very soft okay. with lots of very sparkly special effects. I will have to come up with something like, like, you know, Halloween Town and Hocus Pocus. I love Halloween Town. Oh yeah, well, there's only three movies, you know. Um, there's so movies. It's so sad because there's only three and uh, some folks on the internet are like, no, 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 there's four movies. I'm like, hmm. Bestie. No. Sorry, there's yeah. only three. No, no. No. Um, yeah, it made me sad recently that there was a lot of fuss about the Hocus Pocus sequel, which I haven't seen yet and I will watch it, but um, I just feel like Halloween Town deserves the same attention because it's such a good franchise. Oh, in, in this house, they are equal foot. In fact, I probably love Halloween Town as a trilogy much more than I love Hocus Pocus. Easily. Easily. But yeah. I mean, I also get, you get to spend time in a world and there's the escapism and the witches are the protagonists and, you know, there's all of that. So Yeah, it's just nice. Um, for, for me, I, I love that. But um, mm-hmm. I'm going to I'm gonna have to give you soft and squishy at some point. I would <laughs> love that. We're coming into Christmas season and I love, as much as I love horror, I also love like Hallmark Christmas movies and Netflix Christmas movies. Um, you know where there's like a busy businesswoman and she has to go to the Christmas tree farm. Yeah. In her oh, hometown. listen, I, I I am an aficionado, and I have to say, <laughs> Netflix is churning out some good. Movies. Oh, they're good. They're good. Give Vanessa Hudgens. I put Vanessa Hudgens in everything. Honestly, she, she, <sighs> yeah, the Christmas the switch that was great, but also her the the night the the, the night the before Christmas. Christmas? Yeah, yeah, that. Oh, that Phenomenal. was fun. Yeah. How how that didn't get the same sequel? I don't understand. Uh, there, is there, there, there is oh, a is sequel coming. There is a sequel coming. I think. Yeah, I think um, COVID was a factor, but I, there is a sequel coming either this they, year. They teased at the end year. that there was supposed to be a sequel, and I was yeah. like, "Yes, please, absolutely." And we've got um, we've got a Lindsay Lohan one coming this year, and it's I'm, uh, I think it's filmed in the Ireland. The gays have been counting she... down for a year for that. It's uh, Lindsay Lohan and, uh, uh, or Lowen. I guess we've all been saying Lohan, right Lohan. I, I, I think in Ireland, in Ireland we would call her Lowen. I think that's yeah. the Irish pronunciation. Um, 
yeah and there's an amnesia subplot i'm just i'm so excited i'm just i yeah she i love to quit doing amnesia subplot wasn't that her whole that wasn't that the last movie that she did when it, it her career kind of there fell was, apart was, there was one called i know who killed me which i think was i didn't see it i think there were twins no, and there was one amnesia. Right before where she 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 was it just my luck or something didn't oh, she yeah. like get hit in that. a car accident and she loses her memory and that yeah. was kind of her last big movie yeah it all, it all fell apart and it failed so hard yeah. that was i think though not to speculate too much but i think that some of her extracurricular activities made well, students yeah. less inclined yeah. to like insure her or hire her um but i'm very I excited all to- for a Lindsay lohan uh, yeah oh, I, definitely. I, I would love to see her return yeah uh, that would be great um i would i would i would love that mm-hmm. uh can can we briefly talk about reality television i know that this is horror. going long and this is not at no, all always. horror but there is uh, what, uh, what are you watching uh there is a new season of love is blind coming in four days to netflix wait uh, what yes the 19th of october is the third season of love is blind uh which i'm very very excited about I know there's a trailer and everything online. Um, okay, I I saw the I saw the sort of after the show, which I found yeah. interesting. They didn't really do that for the first season, so the fact it was that they're messy. doing that, yeah. like a whole season of like yeah. after the season, yeah, uh, um, for the most recent season of Love Is Blind, and I saw that. That was interesting. Mm-hmm. I am very obsessed with the mole. Um, in fact, five episodes came out yesterday, and I'm about mm-hmm. to go drink some very cheap wine and watch that and that's the rest of my day and then i'm gonna watch the spiria um but that's a good thing. the mole was a show i swear to god i thought it only got one season a million years ago it had no. like five or six seasons Ooh, i love uh, this like a million years no no, no but like the it, it's a revival on netflix and they're rebooting mm-hmm. it and all of that um but I, I thought it was one season years ago with Anderson Cooper as the host. Mm-hmm. And I thought that was it. No, no, no. He he did like two seasons of the show. And then there were like three more with different hosts. And I had no idea. I loved that show. Loved yeah. I know the premise. I haven't watched it yet. It's on my, it is on my Netflix homepage. So I will watch oh, it. Oh, it's so good. It's so good. Hey, folks, um, we are toying with the idea of maybe Dr. Eva Burke and I doing a little something something on the side. So if that is if that is something that you would be interested in, let us know on social media. I would um, so love that. If, if you would like us to collaborate <laughs> podcastually. Um because <laughs> you're one of my favorite people to talk about um trashy pop culture with. Uh, it's just nobody else gets it like you. Like the the selling sunset conversations we've had. It's just nobody Listen, else gets there it. is so much depth to some of these shows and I wish I, people could understand it. I know. I know. Um, I know. Yeah. No, I'm so I'm watching I'm waiting for Love is Blind. Um I watched Bling Empire the third season. I haven't finished it yet. I'm I um, literally I was watching the last minutes yeah. of uh, of an episode before I came in here. I know I finished it. I feel really bad for Christine and I feel like everybody hates Christine, but I I don't get it. I don't get it. Uh, okay, this is one of the shows wait, wait, Christine from Sunset or Christine No, from, Christine from Bling Empire. From Bling Empire. Okay. Yeah. So so that show I don't know that there are any good people on that show. I think They're everyone very- knows exactly what this kind of show is. And I think everybody is trying to be the villain because they know that when it comes to these Netflix shows, the villain is the one that gets the big following. Yes. Well, I mean, Anna is, I think she's like the heiress to a weapons empire. On- she is. Oh, yeah. she's fascinating. I saw an article yeah. about her and like the fact that she's on this show at all she's yeah. had this like late in life like i think after her father died and mm-hmm. i guess the finally she's a lot la- she she basically did not exist for like 40 years yeah like, her family was incredibly off the map it's very um, murky it's very it's, very murky oh my yeah. gosh everything about anna intrigues me she is steeped there's a in lot blood. going on there she is steeped in blood she um is. But yeah, no, that's that's an interesting one. But I think you're right. I think that they're so the cast is so rich that it's almost well, like, and the kinds of things that they do as jokes for one. I mean, like their mean spirited yeah. stuff is just it's just evil. Like it's yeah. just evil. Yeah. Um, but no, I'm watching that. I haven't finished that yet. Um, 
and I am um, so there was an Amazon Prime show about like horoscope dating or like matching people up with horoscopes that they thought would work together. You know what I love is, is Indian oh. matchmaking. Oh, I love it. I love uh, Seema I Angie. Love yes. Uh, yes. I love Indian it's matchmaking. Still no answer. I love it. Um, It's so mm-hmm. good. I love everything about it. So many mm-hmm. terrible people on that show. Yeah. No, they're just. Many of them are irredeemable, but it's so entertaining to watch. Yeah, um, but yeah, I, I, I will say her. Netflix. Netflix has has some interesting concepts for like mm-hmm. competition reality shows. Yes, they they come up with some unique things. Now later seasons, like you and I have talked about, um, what was that first season of uh, uh, what's the thing with the where they have a fake Alexa and it's oh, it's uh, too hot to handle. Yeah, too hot to handle. The first season of that is so interesting. Yeah. The that premise be is because it's like a proper social experiment, and then yeah. it's the same with Love Is Blind. I think yes. in the later seasons, you just get people who want to be famous or correct um, who are there once for the, the cat is out of the bag of of yeah. what the of what the twist is. Yeah, I think one season is plenty for these things, and then move yeah. on and do something else. One season's interesting because it's yeah. it's you know then you get people going on for the wrong reasons, which you saw in in Love Is Blind season two with what's his yeah. name? Yeah, Shake uh, Shake. Shake. He yes, and horrible. both of the both of the married couples from that season are now divorced or divorcing. So wait, but no. Yeah, no, no. Nick and Danielle. Danielle. And... No. They're separated. Yes, they're separated. I know. I know. No. Okay. So I was not a Nick and Danielle person at all. Not at yeah, all. Not in any way. I thought they were a bad match. Yeah, but and no. Then they're... then I saw the recent then I saw the recent <laughs> season of like after the show and I was like, oh, they're yeah. great together. I know. I was so upset. I was more upset by them than the other couple because uh, Ayanna well, they and They never Derek seemed like they were, were going to work. The other couple never seemed Yeah, that was never going to happen. That was a bad... Well, she, she gave him way too much leeway. They should have never continued on. Um, I think stuff happened that we weren't told about between yeah. them. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, which is their business. But um, yeah. yeah, so neither of the married couples from that season have actually stayed together compared to the first season. So, yeah. I need Netflix to hurry up and get on the the one couple from the first season. I need a whole, I need them to have a whole show. Cameron and... Yes. They were, was it, was it Laura or... I don't remember. I just remember they, were so they like Shonda Rhimes got on there and was like... <gasps> Uh, 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 a mixed race couple that, that this and this and this and she was like yeah I'm like oh my god this is everything like could yeah. Shonda Rhimes make a show about them or something like I just I love them I need I yeah. need they were so genuine and they were there for like the right reasons which unfortunately I think the second season cast was just not well uh, again once you know what the show is going to be even yeah, if you keep is... the topic of the show a secret when you're applying once you get there and you realize oh I'm on Love yeah. is Blind I know how I need to behave here. Like, because I know what, what will get me far. Yeah, because they've seen the show and they know right. who succeeds and who gets the most screen time and attention. But, um, yeah, so I'm waiting for that, the third season of that. Um, There was a fourth season of The Circle, which was okay. It wasn't great, but the Spice yeah. Girls were on it. Yes, I saw that. That, that was that. amazing. That was um, fun. It was yeah. better than, 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 I think, either seasons two or three. The first season was good. Maybe the second mm-hmm. season of The Circle was good better i will say i don't think as far as social experiments go the first season of the circle might be netflix's best Mm -hmm. because again once once people knew what the circle was yeah because then it becomes about strategy correct like Like, you know this is what i need to do to strategize yeah that first season was a true social experiment of yeah it it broke my heart in some episodes i mean i legitimately like was emotional yeah. about some but of it was those really episodes. about like building relationships without really yeah. knowing if the person is genuine and that was really intriguing and the conversations um, about body and body image yeah. and self-love and the way that we present ourselves to the world and, yeah you know then it then it became a catfish hunt and that's just yeah. as though as though so being funny. a catfish were inherently a bad thing yeah or that you were kind of like why are people doing that yeah, I have noticed on on the circle that there is a, a, a strong trend towards attractive women um not doing well. Either people women who are genuinely attractive women or women who are catfishing as attractive women, they never do well. But attractive men, um, either genuine or catfish, um, usually go quite far on it, which I think is interesting. Um yeah, it's a good it's it's a good concept for a show. I would like to see like more kind of variations on the um on the concept 
Of course, that um, would be so hard to do. I mean, it's hard to do yeah. variations on that concept. Because everybody knows what the what the yeah. game is. And yeah, yeah, and it just becomes so, it really does become now about like, oh, I don't think this person is really who they say they are. And that's the focus of the show. Right. That's not what it was at first. And yeah, mm-hmm. I kind of missed that. Yeah. yeah. Um. Dr. Eva Burke, if people want to uh, to to talk to you about about horror, about their favorite horror movies, about is there anything coming up that you're excited to watch? Um, it is yeah, the season of, it's spooky season, and, it's and this will come out on this is this is only coming out next Tuesday, so people will have a few weeks to to get into spooky yeah. season. Other than the official the official head on fire horror movie list, which mm-hmm. once again is Black Christmas 1974, Texas Chainsaw Massacre also 1974. The Fly from 1986, Candyman. 19- By the way, The Fly had a sequel. Did not even know that. Had yeah, no idea. Yeah. Um, Candyman mm-hmm. 1992, Audition 1999, like Mungo 2008, and Suspiria 2018. The Seven Days of Head on Fire Horror, uh, as dictated by uh, Dr. Eva Burke. But Dr. Eva Burke, is there something that you are excited to see that is has yet to come out that you haven't seen? Yeah, so I haven't seen um, Smile yet, which I've heard good things about. It's supposed to be, you know, I, some people are telling me that it exceeded their expectations. No, I, I've, I've heard also good things. That and Black Phone from earlier this year. I never got yes, to see that. And I haven't I'm seen that. So I want to see both of those. Um, I'm probably going to see the newest Halloween film, even though I've heard very mixed things about it. Um, because I'm a completionist and I like to finish sure. a series that I've started um i'm i'm wary because i've heard that it takes a very experimental turn or it does something kind of unexpected i don't know what that is um so i'm gonna see that um on halloween itself i'll probably just watch some good old horror movies um halloween the 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 original halloween um i always like to watch hocus pocus and i will watch hocus pocus too which i haven't seen yet um but i i again i read an article earlier i will um, recommend I will recommend to you the correct way to watch Hocus Pocus is to find your mm-hmm. fuzziest pajamas, mm-hmm. uh, go to the store, buy the cheapest candy. You want to pretend like you just came home from trick-or-treating and you have it into, oh wait, y'all don't do trick-or-treating. No, we do. Yeah, we do. Oh, okay, you do. I know, because I know that like import, Halloween as a modern thing is very United Yeah, it's States. very American, but yeah, no, American we do, uh, thing. we've imported trick-or-treating here. Oh, good. Um, so you want to have, you want to pretend like you just came home with a pillowcase mm-hmm. full of just and they, candy like yeah. not name brand like just wrapped yeah. candy and you want to sit there you want to go into a sugar coma and you want to just consume with your eight-year-old eyes like that's the way to watch this movie yes i'm i'm very excited for that um it is a love yeah. letter to the fans i will tell you that there is a lot of there's a lot of love for the people who love the movie so there's a lot mm-hmm. of winks and nods to queer kids there's a lot of little baby drag queens. There's drag queens all over the movie. Yes, I know there are uh, mm-hmm. some of the RuPaul Drag Race queens in it. No, I'm very excited for that. So that's probably going to be my Halloween. Um, we usually get trick or treaters. Um, in our apartment so now, our jealous. front door is not. Yeah, our front door now is not. Um, it's not street facing, so we don't really get trick or treaters in this apartment. Um, but we used to get them in our old place, and it was so fun because you'd get like hundreds of kids throughout the evening, and they're just so sweet and lovely, and just yeah. I will um, tell you the worst horror thing that I've seen lately is Mr. Harrigan's phone. Oh yes, I heard bad on things Netflix. about Stephen King. Yeah, well, I I ranted about it on on yeah. Twitter, so I I wouldn't. Yes, yeah, so probably but, your yeah. Uh, it, there are some things that should just should should just remain short stories. Like not mm-hmm. every, you know, we don't have to turn Stephen King's grocery lists into full length feature. I mean, like I feel like there's just like oh, you slap Stephen King's name on it and people yeah. can watch it. Like I get that. Um, mm-hmm. but maybe maybe not everything he wrote should should be adapted yeah. there was enough meat there for maybe a 40 30 45 minute mm-hmm. i mean for a short story you know and yeah and they just stretched it out it's so bad there just wasn't but enough there, there there are so many other horror authors as well that we they right. could be adapting yes. you know um there's james herbert who wrote fog um, and a lot of other really good um, Peter Straub. Like, there are so many other horror authors that we could be adapting. Um, so I suppose, again, it's just going back to the idea of the author as a product and the author as a celebrity and mm. um, the name more so than anything else. So if people put Stephen King's whatever, somebody will watch it, unfortunately. Yeah. Well, Dr. Everberg, if people want to get in touch mm-hmm. with you, how do they do that? 
Um, yes, I'm on Twitter. So my Twitter name is EVA underscore B89. Um, and I mostly post cat pictures, but also um, sad tales of my life and uh, and just general observations on the world. Um, I'm on TikTok. I'll put my TikTok um, link in my um, in my Twitter bio. It's you. It's it's genuinely just cat clips again and like clips from TV shows that I've enjoyed. Um, but yeah, Twitter is the best place to get me. Um, if you want to talk about horror or terrible reality shows or um, anything in between those two things. Well, thank you so much for kicking off spooky season here with me. Oh, uh, it is always so a pleasure to get to speak with you. Happy Halloween. Happy Halloween. Happy almost Halloween. It's Happy spooky. almost Halloween. Yes. That is going to do it here for this episode of Head on Fire. My thanks, as always, to my guest, Dr. Eva Burke. I know this was a little bit longer of an episode, but kind of my hope is that uh, it's something you can kind of devour slowly as we get closer and closer to Halloween. Uh, if you like this show and you want to support it, there are a number of ways to help. Uh, consider sharing it with your friends on social media. Uh, letting people know that there is a podcast you like and you listen to is the best way of helping uh, grow the audience audience. Word of mouth is, is truly the best way uh, that you can help the show grow. You could also like or rate the show five stars on uh, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and while you're there, leave a review. Uh, remember that reviews, even just a few emojis, a few words, maybe your favorite quote from a recent episode, uh, help recommend the show to other listeners like you. If you hate ads and promos and all of that kind of thing, consider joining my Patreon on a monthly basis. Patrons receive additional audio and video content, as well as archived episodes, a private Discord server, and you get to help me out with special projects and get little special bonuses along the way. Sign up for as little as a dollar a month at patreon.com slash headonfirepod. We have one last bit of business to attend to. Uh, after the last episode with Taylor Molly, I announced a contest to give away a copy of his Metaphor Dice. Uh, I posted about it on TikTok and Twitter and Instagram, and all you had to do to enter uh, was to basically say you wanted to enter somewhere underneath uh, that post. Well, I am very happy to announce that the winner of that contest is Caitlin, otherwise known as After Laughter, and she won on Instagram. Uh, Caitlin, I sent you a message, and it looks like from your socials that you run a creative writing club. So I, I trust that these dice are going to go into the right hands. I hope that you'll tag me if you and your writing club uh, do something cool with these uh, with these metaphor dice. Make sure to uh, tag Taylor Molly as well. Uh, anyways, thank you all so much for listening. Happy spooky season. And remember, the best horror movie is, is not, is not, is not a horror movie. It's probably Legally Blonde. Thank you. Goodbye. Oh.